A great pleasure to welcome Professor Roberto Zenith. Uh, professor Zenith is a professor at the School of Engineering at Brown University. His group conducts research in the mechanics of two, flu two phase flows, non Newtonian fluid mechanics, fluid mechanics of painting, and biological flows. Professor Zenith is currently an associate editor of Physical Review Fluids and the International Journal of Multiphase Flow. So over to you, Professor Zenith, and you can share your screen and start your talk. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, let me just uh, start my presentation. And see, I see uh, there's a message here. And I, I see, uh, and this, it, this is sharing has been paused. I don't know if anybody knows how to uh, remedy that. Yeah, Anubhav, uh, can you just check this? Uh, I can see this. Green, uh, there is. Are you not able to change your slide? Exactly, that's what I'm not able to do. You, you're not seeing the change of my slides, are you? Could you try again? I'm just. Let me see the share. See this? <laughs> After a year of using. Um, of using um, Zoom, I still have the, have these problems every so often. So let me just, uh, I will, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to hold back this, so I will. About that, here I am. Share screen. Yes. So I'll just uh, I'll just uh, do this for now. Um, and again, I apologize. As I said, uh, I'm I'm never an expert in in Zoom. But anyway, Bala, happy birthday! You are uh, an incredible inspiration for the community, and I am um, um, delighted, honored to be here. Uh, to celebrate your birthday, uh, and and again, and, and in thinking, uh, what should I talk about uh, to honor your incredible career? I couldn't think of a better um, of a better subject than this one. Right? Uh, uh, this is a, a, a subject uh, uh, which is of interest to me. You know, having done um, some work on bubbly flows in collaboration with many friends, in particular Dominique Lejean, uh, who. He's my, uh, my partner in crime in, in bubble studies, uh, also with many students. Um, uh, so this is, again, a, a celebration of your accomplishments. Uh, and I hope that at the end of the talk, uh, which I will focus more on, um, on the concepts uh, uh, to benefit the students in the audience, uh, you, that you will agree with me that this is not just, um, it's not just for, it's not just funny, it's serious science, but, uh, Again, uh, for this audience, I don't need to um, to talk about the motivation of this so because you we all are already convinced of the importance of this. Um, let me see. There's uh, there's two people who have raised their hands. Maybe they know how to uh, fix my problem. And anyway, I'll just continue. Right? So uh, so again, the motivation it's very vast. Uh, for the case of bubbly flows, you know, there is um, a, large, you know, a large amount of methane and uh, carbon dioxide that it basically rises from the bottom of the ocean through the natural processes. And these are very important for um, uh, global warming. So it's important to understand uh, the rate at which these bubbles are ascending in the ocean. It's a nice photo from, the, uh, from Italy. And of course, we use bubbles to clean fluids. Uh, and this is an, an illustration of an aeration tank in which we induce bubbles for um, to capture particles and also um, to induce mixing uh, uh, to, to, to clean fluids in industrial processes. So you have natural uh, processes, industrial processes. And what, uh, what we have today, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, food industry. People, we people like bubbles for many reasons. So I had the opportunity to write this uh, paper with my good friend uh, Javier Rodriguez, um, uh, 
that is just an excuse uh, to to study a, a serious multiphase flow, which is you know, a carbonated drip. You know? uh, and again, the, the advantage of this lab that you have in front of you is at the end of the day, you can drink it and you can toast to uh, somebody who's having a birthday. Uh, again, we equate celebration uh, with bubbly drinks. And uh, so again, we see this see very simple experiment as a laboratory right in front of your eyes, in which you can see uh, the growth of bubbles, um, we'll talk about carbonation in a little bit, uh, the, how the bubbles rise as a result of buoyancy and how they interact forming these bubble chains. Once the bubbles reach the surface, they interact with the surface and that's another very interesting process um, that happens with that. And then uh, depending on the nature of the interfaces, they may accumulate to form a foam or not. Uh, and again, that's another interesting physical process. Uh, that I will tell you about today. Okay, so um, I will touch upon three subjects. I know I have a, a limited amount of time, uh, but I will just uh, tell you uh, three different projects uh, that are inspired by bubbles in drinks uh, uh, that we are working on at the moment. Okay? I talk about how uh, bubbles are, um, uh, uh, the, the birth of bubbles and how they grow. Uh, and also the interaction of bubbles. And I will have to, I, I thank uh, Professor Shuta Kagi for giving a very nice introduction to what I'm going to say today. And to, to end, I will talk, tell you about um, what happens when a bubble reaches the surface and uh, whether or not it bursts or not uh, when you reach that. Right? So carbonation, again, uh, this is a very interesting subject because you know people like, uh, uh, drinks with bubbles because they have, uh, they give the drink a certain texture and the texture improves uh, the perception of flavor, right? Uh, it turns out uh, that uh, the first uh, uh, study of carbonation of water was done by Joseph Presley, who is better known for the discovery of oxygen. And he was trying to, come up with a method to preserve water for ships. Again, uh, you know, this is very early on, the, the, uh, the, the, at the end of the 18th century. Uh, and again, they, what they did is they forced the pressurized bottles uh, with, with air and uh, looked at the, the way the air was dissolved into uh, water. So this is the idea, right? You can dissolve a gas into a liquid according to, the, to Henry's law. The amount of dissolved gas that you can have in a liquid depends, of course, on the pressure at which it's exposed and um, on this constant, which is, depends on the nature of the gas and the liquid that you are um, dealing with. So this is called Henry's law. So what happens with carbonated drinks is that uh, you, uh, you bottle the liquid at a high pressure and either introduce carbon dioxide or the carbon dioxide is produced by fermentation. So when it's closed and it's a high pressure, you can have a liquid without bubbles because it's at higher pressure. But once you open the bottle, then you release the pressure and then you go from, from a high pressure to a low pressure. So the fluid suddenly becomes super saturated. So, so that super saturating, super saturated state is unstable. So the gas has to come out of solution because um, uh, you're violating Henry's law. Right? And that's how bubbles uh, grow. Right? And again, um, uh, bubbles uh, can, bubbles are in this case are carbon dioxide and they can result uh, from fermentation. So if you have water, sugar, and yeast, these are these uh, incredible organisms that uh, like sugar. Uh, so they eat sugar and they produce carbon dioxide and also ethanol. So they, the, the, the oversaturation of carbon dioxide in this case, the overpressure that you need is produced naturally by fermentation. Okay, uh, so the, the way a bubble uh, grows once you have a, um, a super saturated liquid, uh, uh, obeys this um, this equation, which is the Epstein plus equation. So the, the 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 bubble grows as a result of the diffusion uh, of mass through the surface, and it's also dependent on time and dependent on the size of the bubble. Right. So here, and just to show you how that works, I have this uh, movie uh, from again from 
from Javier Rodriguez uh, group in Spain. Uh, I will show you this. So you can see, and this is a cellulose fiber, and these bubbles are being produced in, in beer, as a matter of fact. And you can see that, you know, if, if there's any imperfection in, in the glass or um, in the liquid, uh, we'll have these cavities. And so the, uh, the gas will flow through, uh, will move to that cavity, and bubbles will begin to grow as a, as a result of diffusion, right? So uh, they grow, they grow, and once the buoyancy force is sufficiently large to dislodge the bubble from the nucleation site, you see the formation of the bubble that moves, and eventually you, you see the formation of bubble chains. Okay, so this is a very um, statistically rich process. And we wonder, you know, how, how well does that prediction work, this um, um, epstein plesser equation? Well, you know, again, thank you also, Professor um, uh, Charles Song, who's also here, who spoke uh, yesterday, gave a beautiful talk. They have work in this subject. Uh, and so this is a paper by um, Oscar Enriquez, who would uh, work with, with them at some point. So they, they did this um, very well controlled experiment in which they uh, supersaturated a certain liquid and they produced a, a, a nucleation site and they observed how the bubbles grow in time. Uh, so this is the size of the bubble as a function of time for different saturation uh, pressures. And they compared every prediction of. Um, the abstain plesser equation to the experimental method. So it's always a little bit lower, and they have a, a very interesting discussion why is that the case. And so Professor Prosperity, who will be talking uh, in this symposium tomorrow, uh, they also uh, they, they explain that there is a this boundary layer that um, it's a concentration boundary layer, and also the effect of the wall that masks the, the, the growth of the bubble. And that's why it's always lower than that, right? So the one thing that we want to answer uh, from a, 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 on a similar idea is that what happens when you have many bubbles and what happens when you have real liquids? In, uh, by, that, by real, I mean uh, beer or, uh, or champagne, right? Uh, would uh, such liquids obey um, the Rayleigh, the Epstein equation or not? So we wanted to answer that. So we came up with a very simple experiment in which we pour uh, whatever liquid that we want onto a Petri dish, and we filmed it from, uh, from above. And here's a movie that you can see the formation of bubbles. And using um, image processing analysis, we can look at nucleation sites. So we can track the growth of bubbles at, different, uh, at that location. Uh, in time, uh, and, and we can measure, uh, we can infer what is the saturation pressure uh, that is giving rise to this uh, evolution of bubbles. Right? So this is a typical result. Again, just choosing one of these uh, nucleation sites, we can uh, first, um, what I'm showing here is the bubble radius as a function of time. And you can see that the nuclei, the bubbling frequency is decreasing in time. That means that the, you're losing your bubbles, you're losing carbonation. But if you look closely, at the, here's a, a zoom of uh, one of these bubble events here, uh, you see the growth of the bubble as a function of time does follow the prediction from um, uh, the epstein plesser equation, however, to, in order for us to match these, uh, this growth uh, with the experiments, we need to consider that the diffusion coefficient is actually three times larger than the molecular diffusion coefficient. And this is, again, in the opposite direction to what, um, uh, what had been observed when bubbles are right next to a wall. But this can be explained uh, in terms of convection. Right? So if you have many bubbles, you enhance a uh, motion in the liquid, and this motion enhances diffusion, uh, so the convective effects uh, become important. Okay? So, but again, you know, if we, um, if we have this equation, uh, and we have this enhanced value of the diffusion coefficient, we can actually, uh, by measuring the growth rate and time and size, we can uh, infer what is the saturation level, what is the, the saturation pressure of that liquid. And we take that as a measure of how fast your bubbles uh, are being lost, right? So we, we infer the carbonation pressure 
uh, and basically by changing, by looking at the, uh, how the growth rate of bubbles is de de decreasing in time, we can say that you are decreasing the bubbliness of your liquid, right? And again, if you're a bubbly person, you don't want to lose your bubbles, so you want to know what is happening. Uh, so what we did, we did many experiments, and this is a work by um, Adai Masinka, who works in my lab. He's an undergraduate student at Brown. So we did many experiments with water, you know, just as a, as a, as a base uh, system. And then we made, um, uh, we made the, this uh, synthetic liquid, synthetic drinks, by adding either sugar, citric acid, ethanol, of course, and some surfactants, right? So you can see that the decarbonation rate, how, how fast you lose the pressure, uh, depends on the bottling pressure that you have, but also depends on what you uh, on on all these other active ingredients in your drink, right? So water and what citric acid and water do the same. Uh, surprisingly, these surfactants do not change the the, the the how fast you decarbonate your drink. But sugar and alcohol tend to really increase uh, the decarbonation rate. Of course. You know, since we want to understand this, we did a measurement with champagne, and champagne is over here. The bubbling pressure of champagne is five five atmospheres, and they decarbonate really fast, right? I, uh, this point was a little bit off the chart, so I just added myself. So, Bala, I have an advice uh, for you. If, I can, you know, if you want to preserve your bubbles, you have to drink your champagne really fast. So that's just you know one piece of advice. I hope that you find it useful in this beautiful celebration that you have. Now, the next thing I want to tell you about is bubble motion. Right? Once the bubbles are formed and they begin to ascend uh, vertically, they form these famous bubble chains. And again, it's part of the, the charm of drinking champagne or a nice glass of beer is that they form these beautiful chains uh, and they're very stable. Uh, again, you know, depending on the size of the bubble, they will attain a certain speed, and you can you know, come up with a, a, a scaling. Uh, if the bubbles are very small, you can assume that the, the drag is uh, it's a Stokes type of drag, a Haramar drag, and you can see that it's a slightly different. The, the speed of the bubbles as a function of the radii uh, increases clearly with the size. Yeah? But, uh, and again, you know, you can also measure the, the, the growth rate. But what I want to tell you today um, more in detail, and again, uh, following uh, from Professor Shutakagi's talk this morning, is the following situation. And we see these bubble chains, but, you know, unless you're uh, a bubble enthusiast like, like we are, uh, you don't see anything wrong with this picture, right? You see the bubble chain and you say, yeah, sure. But the one thing that uh, you need to, to realize, you need to see, is that the Reynolds number or the Archimedes number, is, it's, a, it's another way to write the, the Reynolds number. It's a, of order 100. And the bubbles are spherical, so the bond number is small. right? So if you have a bubble that is moving with a certain amount of inertia, this is not supposed to happen. right? This is not supposed to be a stable, a bubble chain because of the lift force. Uh, and again, thank you to Professor Takagi for his nice introduction. Right? So uh, we looked at this and said, this shouldn't be the case. So we went ahead and did some control experiments. Again, okay? first with clean liquids and then with liquids uh, that have uh, similar properties as those in bubbly drinks. So again, it's the simplest possible experiment. We have a, a, a syringe and bubbles forming consecutively. Again, we're uh, removing some layers of complexity. So these are air bubbles as opposed to carbon dioxide bubbles, such that uh, we can assume that they're not growing significantly in time. Okay, so here is, here is the result. This is a, a bubble that has more or less a, a, a similar Reynolds number to that of, of beer or, or, or champagne. And here is the result. Yes, it's a high-speed movie and bubbles are spherical. And as we expected, the bubbles, uh, the, the bubble chain is unstable, right? And again, uh, there's just a certain amount of distance that the bubbles have to travel. So the hydrodynamic interaction between them, and this is a well-known fact, leads to this um, drift mechanism. 
because you know the the and I will elaborate in a little bit. But this is what uh, this is what should happen if the bubbles in champagne were clean. Okay. So the, and this is the key, the key ingredient. Right? So now, if we could keep the fluids clean, again, these are uh, laboratory clean fluids. Uh, this is the, 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 the experiment that I just showed you. There are many bubbles that are being superimposed on top of each other. You see that there's in, and they're unstable. If we make the bubbles bigger, then the, the chain begins to uh, regain some stability, but it's still unstable. But if you make them even larger, right? Uh, these are large bubbles, they're elliptical bubbles, ellipsoidal bubbles, then the bubble, the bubble chain becomes stable again, okay? So there is, a, again, an interesting physics that are happening, uh, but again, the bu small bubbles should be unstable while large bubbles are stable. I, again, I will elaborate on this. Okay, so the secret behind the, the stable chain bubbles in champagne uh, are the presence of surfactant. So again, this is the, the clean liquid uh, bubble chain that is unstable. And if you add surfactants, and in this case, we just add a laboratory type of surfactant, SDS. By adding a small amount, and the small amount is measured by this Langmuir number, it's again, the, the, what is the saturation, uh, the, the, the amount of surfactant that we are adding uh, from, from a laboratory clean liquid to a contaminated liquid, we can actually make that bubble size to become uh, to to form stable bubble chain over here right you see some some few events which is not the case but it's mostly stable right so we have these two two mechanisms that can stabilize the bubble chain one is the uh, the, uh, the addition of surfactants and the other one is the, uh, the deformation of the bubble and in order to uh, explore the mechanism uh, for which this is, uh, the, the physical mechanism to explain this behavior, we conducted numerical simulations. And these are conducted by Omer Atassi, who is a, a brilliant uh, postdoc uh, now in France. So let me show you, show you again, you have these two bubbles uh, that are moving in this, um, in this numerical box. Uh, so let me just show you that. So this is the case where you don't have uh, surfactants and the, again, the Reynolds number and the bond number are uh, relevant to what we're studying. So you see that there's this lift force that uh, pushes the bubbles to the side. But now, thanks to this uh, numerical scheme, you can actually add surfactants in the numerical scheme. And this is what happens. Again, the beauty of numerical simulations is that uh, you can actually have the exact same Archimedes number and the exact same bond number, but add surfactants. You only vary in one thing at a time, and you can actually examine everything up about the flow um, to learn the physics of it. And again, uh, the, the result is summarized here. When you do not have uh, surfactants, the bubbles see each other, and then the distance uh, between them uh, increases in time. They basically become unstable, they, they move sideways. But if you do have surfactants, the two bubbles remain aligned in line, which is what we observe in Champagne. Let me show you a, a few snapshots of the wake of these bubbles. Again, uh, these are, this is uh, the result of these numerical simulations in which we can observe the creation of this, this um, string-wise vorticity that is being uh, generated in the case of a bubble without surfactants, right? So the, 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 uh, I will elaborate on the physical mechanism, but what I want you to, to see here is that the, uh, the sign of the vorticity trail is opposite in this bubble than in the following bubble, right? And that, is, uh, that leads to the, to the appearance of this perpendicular lift force uh, that we have spoken about. If we have surfactants, what we have found is that the sign of the vorticity in the wake is actually the same. Therefore, the, there's a lift force reversal as a result of surfactants. Let me tell you about the mechanism uh, for that, right? Again, thank you, Professor Takagi, about this nice introduction. When you have a bubble that is moving in a certain field that already contains certain amount of vorticity, 
the lift force is expected to be in this direction. Okay? And again, and this will be the case of two, bubble, two, uh, two bubbles interacting, one clean bubble behind another clean bubble. So you would expect the, the, the two, uh, the, 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 for, the lift force to be in, in a certain direction. However, when, you, when the bubble becomes contaminated, the surface becomes immobilized, and there's a lot of vorticity that is produced at the surface. And that uh, vorticity at the surface leads to the appearance of another, uh, of a lift force of the opposite direction. So if the amount of vorticity generated on the surface dominates the amount of vorticity on the upstream field, then the, you can expect the appearance of a lift force in the opposite direction. Another way to generate uh, vorticity uh, in the surface of the bubble is by, by deformation. If the bubble is ellipsoidal, uh, the fact that it has to go around generates this additional vorticity. And so again, in this way, we can explain why our ellipsoidal bubbles have these stable chains and why our clean bubbles or uh, contaminated bubbles uh, have the, the, lift, uh, the reversal of the lift force. That explains why you know, this situation in which you have these bubble chains in Champagne uh, uh, are stable chains because of the presence of surfactants. The surfactants in the case of Champagne are basically the, 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 the flavors, uh, all those other molecules that we're not accounting for, those are surfactant molecules. And the beauty, the beauty of the flavor of Champagne comes from the, the, the surfactants uh, that are part of that. Okay, uh, let me see how am I doing in time. I want to tell you one, one last thing, um, if, if, I'm, if, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I guess if you leave out some time for questions, then maybe you can yes. take two more minutes. I will take just, I will just do one last thing because I, again, it's part of my celebration to, to, sure. to Bala's birthday. You know, when the bubbles reach the surface, what happens, right? This is a movie, a bubble reaching a surface and they interact with the free surface and the bubbles eventually burst and they, uh, the air in the bubbles just, just escapes the atmosphere. Right? Well, it turns out, right? And again, uh, this is uh, my, uh, my, the way I celebrate uh, Bala is with this traditional Mexican drink, uh, which you drink when you celebrate a birthday. And in particular, this type of, uh, this is a, it's an agave based drink. Um, and one of the things that we discovered is that the traditional way to make mezcal, and this is a, a, a mezcal making maestro, they do it like this, right? So they have a jet of fluid with impinges onto a, a surface. And what they observe is that there are bubbles that are, uh, that are being produced by the, this interaction. And what is interesting is that these bubbles remain in the surface for a long time. Long time meaning tens of seconds. And so we were intrigued by this. And of course we did many experiments, but we basically found that when the concentration of alcohol in mezcal is the correct amount, then the lifetime of the surface bubbles sharply increases. Uh, and again, you know, this is just a beautiful example of why uh, we study bubbles. We want to understand what is the physical mechanism that can explain such a traditional uh, method to make uh, this drink. Uh, so we did these experiments, and the answer is uh, related to surfactants of sort, right? So uh, you see that this is a bubble uh, in a surface of a mezcal glass. You see that there's a convective motion of the of the fluid within the film that is a result of the presence of, of surfactants and the gradient of them. So we conducted numerical simulations, we conducted experiments to explain this behavior. And I end with this. Uh, this is a, a, a photo that um, my very good friend Dominique uh, Legendre took in somewhere in New York. This is the best way I can think of uh, celebrating Bala's accomplishments in the field of two-phase flows. Again, he also did work in, in the lift reversal, uh, the reversal of the lift force. And it gives us the opportunity to do serious fundamental research 
But another thing which is important in, uh, from my point of view is it allows us to talk to other groups of people, to do, uh, talk about science, to, to artisans and people uh, not in technical fields. So uh, to me, that is important. So I, I, I had the, the, the chance, the opportunity, the fortune of being able to talk about the two-phase flows to other audiences. And uh, I hope that you also place value on that. So with that, I finish. And again, uh, salud Bala. Thank you very much for your leadership. You are an inspiration to all of us. And thank you for the organizers uh, for this opportunity to talk. So thank you so much, Professor uh, Roberto. So uh, we have time for, we have about a minute now uh, for a few quick questions. So anybody would like to go? Uh, Roberto, I, I want to start by saying that uh, your talk always leaves me intoxicated. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, you have the uh, uh, knackful art of uh, talking about beer and uh, mezcal and uh, uh, champagne, uh, and I don't need a real drink, just your talk makes me intoxicated. Uh, excellent talk, thank you. I will let others ask the question. Thank you, Bala. So uh, I will read out a question which is there in the chat box. You can also yes. see. Yeah. So it says, what will be the role of background flow in case of stability of bubble chains? As the experiments showed here, as the experiments showed here are carried with stationary fluids in background. Uh, yes, an excellent question. In a, in a, it's been shown, it's a, it's a very, um, there's a group in France that studies this very carefully. There's a, there's a lot of convection that occurs as a result of the motion of bubbles in, 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 in flows. So the, the important thing about that, you know, this, this, this uh, again, there will be another flow. Um, the bubbles react to this, this, this shear, uh, the gradients of velocity in, within the bulk, right? So as long as they're not strong gradients, the, uh, the stability of the bubble chain should be more or less the same as with a stagnant liquid. And again, uh, this, 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 it, all remain, it all depends on the strength of the, of the shear in the, in the background flow. But it's an excellent question, yes. Right, so Heman Singh asks, can size of bubble increase after leaving the surface? Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, Hemant asks, can the size of bubble increase after leaving surface? Uh, well, let me see if I can understand it. So let me just go here. If you look at the growth of bubbles over here, right? Of course, in, in this case, yes, it's a, a, they're growing because they're stagnant and there's diffusion. So they grow and uh, they continue to grow even after they have left the nucleation site um, at a different rate, right? It's actually interesting because um, once when they are attached to, to a certain surface, then the, the, the diffusion, the growth is dominated by diffusion. But once they begin to move, the growth um, becomes dominated by convective effects. So they do grow, uh, but at, at a different rate. Okay, so. Uh... The last question is, please comment on the relationship between stable chains of bubbles and unstable chain with cleaning property of surfactants. With cleaning property? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let me think. The cleaning, the surfactants are used to clean because they reduce surface tension. Uh, you know, you wash your hands with soap because they, uh, the, the surface tension is reduced, so, so water can't penetrate porous or uh, stuff like that, then they can actually capture uh, lipid type of uh, molecules. So in the case of bubble chains, that's like an excellent question. Uh, the mechanism that leads to the stabilization of the bubble chain, uh, what I have uh, sketch here does not take into account the surface tension effect. So uh, surface tension does not uh, affect the, st the stability directly, right? What the, what the surfactants do in this case, in addition to reducing the surface tension, they immobilize the surface. So those are two different mechanisms. 
One is the reduction of surface tension, and the other one is the immobilization of the, of the surface. And if its surface is immobile, and again, uh, Bala uh, showed this in one of his papers, then you produce more vorticity, and that vorticity feeds into the wake, and that uh, additional vorticity is what leads to the uh, appearance of a lift force in the opposite direction that uh, results in the stability of a chain. Yeah, so in the interest of time, I think we will have to uh, move on to the next speaker. So thank you so much, Professor Roberto, for the.